this will reflect material that is contained in um, a book that is coming out, I hope, any month now um, from Princeton University Press, and it's called What's Divine About Divine Law. I wanted it to be called What's So Divine About Divine Law, but they uh, forced me to take the so out of, out of the title, but What's Divine About Divine Law, Early Perspectives, and it really looks at this concept um, down really to the end of the Talmudic period. Um, so this is one little portion of some of the argument that's made in that book, but it, it doesn't really reflect the entire argument. Um, but what I will do, is it okay to start? Are we done? Okay. Uh, well, what I will do, I, I wanted to discuss uh, two uh, ancient Jewish constructions of divine law um, that I think are mirror images of one another um, and which were, I want to argue, constructed in response to wider developments in the Greco-Roman world. We have to understand both of these as embedded within a larger um, negotiation with, with other the things that are going on in the Greco-Roman world. So these are constructed um, as in response to wider developments in the Greco-Roman world, but also while looking in the mirror. Right? They're also attuned to what's happening uh, in, in one another. The first construction accepts and is predicated upon the Greco-Roman dichotomy between divine law and human positive law. Right? This is one of the characteristic features of, of Greco-Roman thought altogether, that when we speak of divine law, we are by definition engaging in a discussion within a dichotomy between divine law and human positive law. And the second um, construction, uh, a, a Jewish construction, resists that dichotomy. Um, so first what I need to do is to sketch these, the Greco-Roman discourses of law that I think each of these two Jewish constructions is negotiating with. And here I will do short shrift to a chapter in my book which is actually about 70 pages long, which looks at 10 different Greco-Roman discourses of law, bichlal, but also divine. And so I, apologies to anyone with any sensitivity to classical issues. This is going to be very schematic, and, and I recognize that. In much Greek thought, divine law is divine because it expresses the profound structure of a permanent natural order. Um, for the Stoics, now the Stoics were the ones who coined the term divine law, theos nomos, as a metaphor for their version of natural law. Um, it doesn't refer to a law of the gods. It refers to a, a logos, an unwritten rational order that's embedded in the physical world, it's embedded in our uh, natures as well, rather than something that's imposed upon the world by a god from without. So, many ancient Greeks would have answered the question, what's divine about divine law, by asserting that divine law is divine by virtue of certain qualities that it possesses, qualities inherent in it. First and foremost, its rationality. In fact, it's self-identical with logos, with reason, with a rational order. Um, but its rationality also entails its, <coughs> its truth value, its universality, we are all creatures of reason, and its static, eternal, unchanging, immutable character. So those are the four key characteristics, rationality, truth value, universality, immutability. Greco-Roman thought opposes divine natural law, and I will use those terms together, divine natural law. For the Stoics, natural law is divine law because God is nature, and nature is therefore the mind of God, so the reason embedded in nature is this divine reason. So um, they um, oppose divine natural law with human positive law. Human positive law is not grounded in reason. It's grounded in will. It's grounded in the will of a sovereign. It is expressed as concrete rules and prohibitions that can be set in writing, another key characteristic of of the divine law is that it is unwritten by definition for the Stoics. The minute you have something in words and written, it's by definition human positive law. Uh, in the, in Greco-Roman conceptions, human law doesn't of necessity possess any of the characteristics that are inherent in the very idea of, uh, of divine law. It may contain rational elements, but it can also contain arbitrary or irrational elements that don't correspond with truth. We all agree to stop at a red light, not because red makes us naturally come to a halt, right? But this is something we agree to, but the law doesn't necessarily conform with truth or falsity, right? This is just, it's not a relevant category. So this dichotomy of divine law and human law, which is basic to all the many different Greco-Roman discourses about law, that's represented on your, your handout, right? That's the, the first chart where I line up the characteristic traits of these two. Um, by contrast, according to biblical tradition, divine law is divine, not by virtue of any inherent quality, but because it emanates from a god who is the master of history. Um, divine law isn't the expression of an impersonal, natural reason. 
It's not the expression of the rational order of the cosmos. Rather, it's the expression of a personal divine being's will, which can take the form of detailed written instruction and legislation. So ancient adherence to biblical tradition uh, would have answered the question, what's divine about divine law, by pointing to its origin in a divine will, a will that's expressed in history rather than nature. And while adherence to biblical tradition may have assumed that their, law, their God was good and his law was good, beyond establishing its point of origin, the attribution of divinity to the law did not in itself necessarily and essentially confer upon the law specific qualities like rationality and its various entailments, truth, universality, immutability, and so on. The specific character of the law is something to be discovered. So the characterization of divine law and the Greco-Roman notion of divine law as utterly rational and in harmony with nature and truth, this was widespread throughout the Hellenistic world of late antiquity, and there's lots of footnotes that would help me to make that case, so I hope that you'll please just accept that. Lots of other people have done the work, Mal Arab and others have shown that this permeated everything from the rhetorical handbooks to um, inscriptions on, on, on tombs uh, and graves. Notions of divine law um, were, were everywhere. And my argument in the book is that this created a cognitive dissonance for Jews um, whose divine law didn't look like the Greco-Roman definition of divine law, and in fact looked a lot more like the right-hand side of the picture that I've given you here, right? It has the characteristics of what in the Greco-Roman world would be human positive laws written, it's grounded in the will of a sovereign, doesn't necessarily conform to truth, it has irrational and arbitrary elements in it, usually the purity and deity law, dietary laws are singled out for that. It's particular for a particular group of people. Uh, it, it seems to be mutable even in the Bible itself. God adds to it a few times and things change. So these the elements of biblical divine law most often singled out in late antiquity as irrational and arbitrary, and therefore as, a, as challenging the idea that this could be a divine law, are the dietary laws and the impurity laws and circum circumcision. These laws were especially embarrassing to Jews, to Jews who fully embraced the Greco-Roman ca characterization of divine law as necessarily and intrinsically rational. And these Jews, those who embraced that dichotomy, um, responded to the cognitive dissonance generated by the presence of irrational laws in the divine law of Israel. Uh, one strategy is to recast them as utterly rational, right? Utterly conforming to reason. So that's one response I'm going to spend a little time with. I'm going to be spending some time with the rabbinic response, which I think is very, very different as well. So if we turn first to the letter of Aristeas, right? This is a second century BCE work by a Hellenistic Jew from Alexandria which offers an apologetic defense of Jewish law and custom by asserting that there's nothing irrational in the law. There's no prohibition or obligation that lacks a telos or a rational end, but that's only part of it. It's not just that it serves a rational end. I think it's my feedback. I think it's my echo. It's just me talking back to myself. <laughs> so it's, it doesn't bother me, but it might bother me. Um, so there, it, it's that the laws are actually inherently or intrinsically um, rational. So in the debate between, or the discussion, it's not a debate, it's a very friendly discussion that happens between the envoys of King Ptolemy and the high priest LSR, um, the envoys express curiosity um, about precisely these two elements that appear the most irrational, the dietary and the ritual and purity laws. And the way they phrase the question, or the way the question is phrased for them by the author is important. Um, what possible reason, what rationality could there be for treating some food and drinks and animals as impure when they're all part of one kind, natural kind, right? There's, there's no distinction among natural kinds. Discrimination among natural kinds or like things seems irrational. Um, and so I've given you some, some passages from the letter of Aristeas. Uh, for I suppose that most people feel a curiosity with regard to some of the enactments in the law, especially those about meats and drinks and animals recognized as unclean. When we asked why, since there is but one form of creation, some animals are regarded as unclean for eating and others unclean even to the touch. For though the law is scrupulous on most points, it is especially scrupulous on such matters as these, he began his reply as follows. So you see what their, their problem is, is the arbitrariness of the irrationality of it. 
And in response to this, Eleazar, the high priest, admits that the categories of pure and impure, is, yes, that seems a little odd and unnatural because all foods and animals are in their nature one, but he insists that this still isn't arbitrary. Um, and he will, in 143, I'm, I'm not going to read all these texts necessarily, um, but he is going to argue that not only do they separate Israel from corrupting influences, the laws are in their substance, in the actual character of the laws. They are deeply rational and ethical, which you can see if, of course, you employ allegory, which means your reason. And if you read them rationally, you will discover that they are rational. Um, they are indications formulated with great wisdom to teach a moral lesson, he says. Um, and, and then he, he explains exactly how it is. The particular animals that are singled out have character traits that one does not want to um, emulate and so on. And in a final flourish, he says that the legislation was not laid down at random, it is not arbitrary, or by some caprice of the mind, but with a view to truth, aletheia, and as a token of right reason, orthos logos. There's nothing arbitrary or random about the dietary laws and the laws of impurity. So that's all in, in 161. So this rationalist defense of the Mosaic Torah in the letter of Aristeus is intended to show the latter's fundamental compatibility with Hellenistic divine natural law or divine law discourse. It's entirely rational and therefore it's true. Um, and therefore it can be observed by Hellenized Jews as the divine law without fear of ridicule. You see another apologetic defense in 4th Maccabees. Um, this one I, I really like because of the language that's used. Now we're moving um, uh, to the first century of the Common Era. We have the charge quite explicitly. This time the discussion is not so friendly. There's a very hostile tyrant, of course, Antiochus, who's making this very hostile charge where he's very explicit. Your law can't be a divine law because it's not rational uh, and it's not true. And in response, the author is going to say, no, this is philosophos logos. This is uh, wisdom loving reason. Um, and like the letter of Aristeus, um, for the author of Four Maccabees will also betray a concern to counter the charge of irrationality to portray life under Jewish law um, as a life of philosophy and wisdom. And again, it's the dietary laws, impurity laws. These are the ones that come in. They were specifically the ones that Jews felt self-conscious about in terms of outsiders looking at them, seeing them as irrational, and therefore a mark of the human nature of these laws and not its divine nature. Um, so he places these mocking words in um, the tyrant's mouth, um, and I think I provided this as well. Why should you abhor eating the very excellent meat of this animal when nature has provided it? Right? This is against nature. It's irrational and it's unnatural. For it is senseless, irrational, not to enjoy delicious things that are not shameful and not right to decline the gifts of nature. So it's both irrational and unnatural. But you seem to me to do what is even more senseless if because you cherish a vain opinion concerning the truth, you continue to despite me at the cost of your own punishment. <laughs> Will you not awaken from this silly philosophy, dispel the nonsense of your reasonings, and adopt a mind worthy of your age, pursue a true philosophy? But look at the language, right? Look at how loaded all of this language is about the unnatural, irrational, senseless, arbitrary nature of this law. And Elazar is going to respond, the law is indeed divine, he says. You're wrong to think that it's not divine, and it is sensible to live by it. It's rational because the law, he says, has been imposed in accordance with nature. So you see how he's using the same language. Got the, the, the law permits food that's good for the soul. It forbids what's contrary to the soul, teaching us certain you know, ethical beliefs and so on. What's important to notice, though, because this is so different from what the rabbis will do, What's important to notice is that Eleazar and the tyrant Antiochus agree on what it is for the law to be divine, right? Uh, to be divine means to be rational and in harmony with nature. Their only dispute is whether the law of the Judeans possesses those qualities and so can rightly be called divine. Antiochus says, no, the dietary laws are evidence that it's irrational and arbitrary. It can't be divine. But like the letter of Aristeus, uh, 4th Maccabees, um, also doesn't question the terms of the debate. He accepts the convention according to which divine law must be rational and in harmony with nature. And then he works apologetically to defend um, the law of Moses so that it meets these criteria. The dietary laws conform to nature. They're rational not just in their purpose but in their substance and therefore they're divine. I think a very different negotiation with larger cultural conceptions of divine law as 
both rationality and truth. I'm going to focus for a moment more on truth. We've been talking about rationality. I'm going to focus now on truth. And when I get to the rabbis, I'll look at both rationality and truth. So signposts for you. A different negotiation with the conception of divine law as truth is found in the writings of the community at Qumran. Following Daniel Schwartz, I've argued at some length in other writings for uh, what well, I think he's correct about a realist approach to the Torah at Qumran, according to which the divine law is expected to conform to what I will call mind-independent ontological reality or natural reality. The way things really are is how he phrased it. That's not such a great phrasing in his article, but mind-independent ontological reality. Whether we access that information through empirical observation or through common sense or logic, like mathematical calculations of the calendar, or through a divine revelation which gives us access to some sort of truth or cosmic reality, however we gain access to or knowledge of that mind-independent ontological reality, at Qumran, it plays a very strong determining role in, a strong role in determining the halakha, or the law, the divine law. So an appeal to nature, um, relying on empirical observation is found in the Damascus document where the proper manner for slaughtering locusts, whether you do it by water or fire, is grounded in the fact that it is the rule or the order of their creation, kihu mishpat bruyatam, right? Um, possibly a reference to the fact that locusts had no blood for you to even spill on the ground, so um, you wouldn't slaughter them in that way. Um, an appeal to nature supported by scripture, they understand scripture to be a reflection of the way things really are, the way they've been created. So an appeal to the scriptural account of creation is also used to reject um, polygamy. It violates the basic principle, yesod habri'a is what it says in uh, the Damascus Covenant. Um, the yesod habri'a as stated in, uh, in Breshit, um, zakar unke vabara utam, right? Male and female, he created them. So we have appeals to certain forms of knowledge, what, what the Qumran community, the sectarian community would have considered to be certain forms of knowledge. Sometimes that's um, given in other ways through divine revelation. Texts valued by this community, like Jubilees, reflect upon the same, um, I think reflect the same kind of realist approach to determining the law. So Jubilees, for example, draws upon Ezra's very realist delineation of Gentiles as non holy seed, Israelite says holy seed, to say these are ontologically distinct. They have been given that status by God and they cannot be intermingled. The sectarians also believe that these are facts of the created order and these classifications cannot be revised by human beings. The calendar as well. Um, and for the interest of time, maybe I'll, people are familiar with the whole issue of the calendar, I hope, but this is another example where we see in sectarian literature um, there, the insistence, lo lekadem velo lehitacher, the dates of the festivals, right? You, they, that, that, which means there are real dates, um, and you can't advance them or delay them for matters of convenience in the view of the sectarians and so on. These, the calendar is the calendar that's observed in heaven. These things are written on the tablets in heaven. Um, this is observed by the angels. They observe the festivals on these days. Circumcision is even something that is angelic. It's somehow embedded uh, in in nature. So. So for the letter of Aristeus and for 4th Maccabees, the attribution of divinity to the Torah entails its rationality. It conforms to reason. We use allegory to show that that's true and so on. In works that are written by or esteemed by uh, the sectarian groups, the attribution of divinity to the Torah entails that it is truth in the sense of conforming to some sort of mind-independent ontological reality, and we can show this by appealing to nature and cosmic realities in determining the law. As is well known, um, it's Philo, uh, again, first century now, Alexandrian Jew, Jew, who's going to go the farthest in resolving the cognitive dissonance between Greco-Roman and biblical conceptions of divine law. He will just assert the identity of the two, essentially, and then he will labor to demonstrate that the Torah of Moses possesses all of the properties on that left-hand um, side of the chart on your first sheet, all of the qualities of the Greek natural divine law. It is self-identical with truth. Um, it is rational, it is immutable, it is universal, and it is unwritten. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on the claims that it is um, true and rational. It, it, he claims it's unwritten because he claims the written copy is just a, a, a copy. The written version is a copy of the unwritten law, 
And we know that because the patriarchs observed it, and they observed it before it was given in written form, because they read it in nature, and therefore we know that the Torah is actually the unwritten law of nature. But his conception <coughs> of the Mosaic law and its conformity to truth, rational philosophical truth, its verisimilitude, its lack of any contradiction or irrationality, is very indebted to Stoic conceptions of divine law. And I think Marin Niehoff has done some important work demonstrating that Philo was harshly critical of those who did not share his belief in the biblical text's perfection, um, those who explain the Bible's contradictions and lack of verisimilitude in literary terms or historical terms. Um, and she cites Philo's declaration, I don't know if I put this on here, um, that in every respect the holy writings are true. The Bible is not mere literature. He says it points to the truths of nature, which can sometimes be exposed through allegorical readings. And he writes, in the poetic work of God, you will not find anything mythical or fictional, but the canons of truth all inscribed. <clears throat> As for rationality, um, Philo holds that um, the Torah is precisely to instruct uh, people in matters of doctrine and philosophy. And he says, for this reason, Moses didn't simply set forth bald commandments with penalties for disobedience, like a tyrant addressing arbitrary decrees to slaves. I guess he didn't read Deuteronomy. Instead, he adopts a tone of exhortation. He includes rationales so that the laws assumed the character of suggestions and instruction addressed to free and rational individuals. So I'm giving these examples rather quickly, I admit, <clears throat> to show that in Second Temple texts, Second Temple period texts of diverse provenance, we find discourses in which the divinity of scripture is believed to entail its utterly rational character, its conformity to truth and reality. Significantly, in each of the works that I've referred to, um, uh, more or less this view is, con uh, they, they more or less construct their conception of the Torah as, as true or rational um, explicitly in awareness of the mirror image viewpoint. I turn back to Marin Niehoff for a moment to, to make this claim. This is going to be an important part of what I want to say today. So Marin Niehoff has traced the existence of opposing views about the nature of scripture in, in Philo's time by focusing on the literary motif of mockery in the writings of Philo. Philo presents himself and his views as the object of mockery or ridicule by opponent, opponents who dismiss his truth claims about, about the biblical text. Right? This is crazy to other people. We need it's true. It's literature, it's history, it's many things, not philosophy. And he depicts himself as being mocked for holding that view. I think I brought this text. They say, they say, right? Now, do you still speak solemnly about the ordinances as if they contain the canons of truth herself? For behold, the books called holy by you contain also myths about which you regularly laugh whenever you hear others relating them. Right? See, he's, he's able to articulate the point of view of his opponents. In turn, his writings contain plenty of abuse and mockery um, against those anonymous opponents who believe that the Bible isn't necessarily rational philosophy or philosophical truth. I know such that such things, he's just been discussing redundant expressions and he's showing that none of them's redundant, they're all very important. I know that such things provoke laughter and mocking derision in uncultivated men and those lacking propriety of manners as well as those who do not see any form or manifestation of virtue and who attribute their own incorrigibility and stupidity as well as perversity and impudence to the holy scriptures which are verified, which are true more than anything. So this motif of mockery, I think, is very important. In Philo's writings, it tells us plainly that Philo's construction of the Torah was accomplished in full awareness of the fact that others did not attribute to biblical divine law the characteristic traits of Greco-Roman divine law discourse, chief among them truth and rationality. Likewise, the polemical character of some Qumran uh, literature and some Qumran statements uh, make it clear that the sectarian construction of the Torah as corresponding to truth was accomplished, again, I think, in full awareness of the fact that others disagreed with them. Others did not attribute to biblical divine law a conformity to cosmic and natural realities. They permitted polygamy or remarriage um, in violation of the order of creation, and they permitted intermarriage with conversion in violation of what they thought was the ontological and real distinction between human seeds. They advanced and delayed the dates of the festivals and holy days in violation of divinely ordained uh, calendrical times. 
And even the letter of Aristeus, the tone is certainly more peaceful, it's more irenic, but it also um, asserts the utter rationality of the Torah in the context of a staged debate with someone who holds a different view, right? Um, and of course, 4th Maccabees, it's obvious, it's a very clear, hostile, polemical context. So in all of these writings, the gaze of the other uh, plays a critical role, whether it's mocking, whether it's combative, whether it's merely curious, as in the letter of Aristeus, it plays a critical role in each work's construction of divine law as possessing the qualities of truth and rationality. I think the gaze of the other is also present in rabbinic texts that I'm going to examine next, but the view afforded by this gaze um, reveals a construction that is the mirror opposite of that of the authors we've looked at till now, the works that we've ex examined till now. Because for the rabbinic construction of, um, the rabbinic construction of divine law, I argue, resists the Greco-Roman dichotomy between divine and human law that was on that chart. It does not insist uh, on the divine mosaic law's conformity to truth or rationality. Uh, um, and this is what I think is going to be so interesting and important about their construction of law. They walk away <coughs> from this dichotomy. No. Who says that divine law is necessarily universal or true or rational? And they're going to have to construct something in its place. So first on the matter of truth. Uh, the rabbinic construction of the divine law is, I think, the mirror opposite of that of Philo and that of Qumran. The ascription of divinity to the Torah does not entail the idea that it necessarily conforms to or is self-identical with truth. Now, there's a very long chapter in my book. This is one of the longest chapters in the book, partly because we don't have the Greco-Roman concept of truth in rabbinic literature, right? The word emet does not function in this way. It is not, it is not the same as aletheia. Emet usually has more to do with uh, uh, faithfulness or lack of corruption, particularly in judicial contexts. It's, it's not about truth. So I had to find some way to, uh, to be able to assess this whole question that was native to rabbinic sources. And I ended up deciding that I had to find some measure of something that was fixed and stable and then see what the Torah's relationship to it was. So ultimately, I found that there were three measures of something fixed and stable in rabbinic literature. And in all three cases, Torah does not necessarily align with it. It can, but not necessarily. So. Um, so I, that was just methodologically to let you know what it was I was doing. I, I argue that the Torah is not seen by the rabbis as necessarily conforming to or self-identical with truth as measured in one of three ways. Logical or formal truth, and for this the word din is very important, right? Logical or formal truth, the Torah is not always logical and formal truth. Judicial truth, right, in a, in a judicial context, deciding who is guilty or innocent, right or wrong and ontological truth in the sense of a mind-independent reality. On all three of those measures, and they have different language for those, the Torah deviates from them. I can't deal with all of them, so I'll just give you one. I'm happy if there, if there is time for questions to talk about any of the others. I'm just going to mention formal or ontological truth just very, very quickly, because it's one that permeates all of rabbinic literature. In the case of logical or formal truth, we see time and time again that the rabbis take pains to adopt a rhetoric that points out that the operative halakha, the divine law, doesn't necessarily accord with formal truth or logical correctness. And I offer just one example out of literally hundreds. I could, I could randomly pick this out of almost any, any place. Okay, and, I, and I'm gonna, here's a parenthesis. I wanna say something else too. Very often a question I get is, well, wait a minute, there's you know, written Torah and oral Torah, and isn't that the same thing as divine law and human law? The answer is no. So I can save us a lot of time. Um, no. The oral Torah, which is the rabbinic elaboration of the written Torah, is not underwritten by an independent human, a source of human authority, right? Natural law and divine law are grounded in different sources of authority in Greco-Roman thought, so that the positive law is grounded only in the will of a human sovereign, right? The oral Torah, um, which I do think, is in some ways an interesting response to Greco-Roman um, ideas, but it's precisely not an independent source, it's not grounded in an independent source of authority. The source of authority is still the divine will, all right? We can have a, a larger conversation about what I think they're doing with oral Torah and written Torah, but just for now, in case that's occupying anyone's mind as we go through this, okay? So, um, I, the example I give is Mishnah Menachot, and I don't, did I bring this actually on the paper, or did I not? Yeah, I did. Okay, so just a very quick example. Oh. Perfect example, meal offerings, right? Um, might logically be thought to require the purest 
olive oil. I can't remember now what it is. Zayi, or something like this. I don't know. Um, because if the menorah, which is not intended for achila, for consumption, requires the purest olive oil, then the meal offerings, which are intended for consumption, the deen, right? Shouldn't it, isn't it logical? Deen, this is the important word, that they would require it? Ah, but no, look at that scripture says <coughs> they don't, right? It says oil, pure olive oil, beaten for the light, and not for meal offerings. Now, I don't know that if I read that verse in scripture, the first thing that would come to my mind is, look at that, they want that for the menorah and not for, for a meal offering. There's work that they've done here, right? If we enter their workshop, we realize that they have gone out of their way, and in their rhetoric, they go out of their way to point out to us that scripture goes against reason here. And this is not something they do once. It's something we get so accustomed to, however, when we study rabbinic texts, right, that we almost don't see it. But this rhetoric is meaningful. This is meaningful rhetoric, and again, it happened, I, I could bring you so many examples. Logically, the law should be X, but scripture declares the law to be something else against the dictates of formal logic or reason. And I could do this too with judicial truth and show you cases where they say, but Dean, the, 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 the judicial answer should be this, but you know, peace is just as important as truth. Truth is important, but it's not the trump card, and there might be other values that we would bring into conversation with truth. We find this in Tosiftus and Hadrian. We found this in some other texts as well. Truth is important, but it's not the be-all and end-all. It's not the trump card. Other things get weighed in. And then, of course, the famous case cases where Torah law deviates from ontological or physical reality, I don't need to go into the calendar. Rosh Hashanah, I think she, we lost her. <laughs> so, in any event, um, oh, yeah, so you know what, maybe I'll skip that. Is everybody comfortable with my skipping the sort of non-conforming to, um, to uh, natural or ontological reality in contrast to the sectarian texts that uh, very much draw attention to a very explicit and conscious realist calculus when determining law, the rabbinic texts draw attention to. It's not that they just do it and don't point to it, they point to it. They draw attention to their conscious, explicit, non-realist, nominalist approach. It doesn't mean it's the only thing there, I make that clear. I know rabbinic texts are many and varied, but there are many texts that show that they don't automatically privilege conforming to what they themselves identify, we may not, but what they themselves identify as natural or ontological reality. Um, the example of the calendar, I think, is an obvious one. Did I cite that text for you? I hope I did, the Rabbi Akiva. Yeah, so there's a great text for you. Um, the famous calendar debate, you know, where Rabbi Gamliel in Mishnah Rosh Hashanah accepts, knowingly accepts false testimony. There's clearly some discomfort with that. In the Bavli, Rabbi Akiva is represented as uh, pre presenting the following statement. Rabbi Akiva then said to Rabbi Yoshua, the text says you, 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 three different times dealing with calendar, we have this idea of you, to indicate that you may fix the festivals even if you err, make a mistake, accidentally, inadvertently, you, even if you make a mistake, deliberately, and you, even if you're misled, it doesn't matter, right? It's a nominalist approach to the law. And Rabbi Yoshua says, you've comforted me. So Rabbi Akiva is not disturbed by the fact that truth is a casualty of the nominalist approach to halakha. Rabbi Yoshua, on the other hand, is clearly anxious about the deviation of divine law from ontological truth, so the juxtaposition of the two views, this is what's important to me, the gaze of the other. Here it's an internal other, here it's a rabbi. But the fact that this writer, this author, this rabbinic author, can juxtapose these two views makes it clear that the nominalism, the nominalism endorsed by the rabbinic author of our text is a conscious choice. It's made in full awareness of the fact that there's an alternative position that would insist on the law conforming to truth. So we also see rabbinic nominalism in many other ways. They tolerate all sorts of anti-realist strategies in determining the law. Legal fictions and legal presumptions. It's probably no accident that legal fictions first arise in two laws that are contiguous with one another, two legal systems that are next to each other in time and place, Roman law and rabbinic law. This is our two, the two first uses of legal fictions and legal presumptions. Um, uh, I, I'm going to skip. Um, Yes, and closely related to legal fiction, I have an example of that, but we'll move on to legal presumption. Rabbinic law employs presumptions when a conclusion about facts is needed, but proof of the fact is absent. Legal pre the legal presumption that all women are presumed ritually pure for their husbands, that's in Mishnah Nida 2.4, despite the not insignificant probability um, or possibility that a woman may in fact be menstruating, um, or when a husband returns for a trip, for example. And this could even be checked, but still the presumption is allowed. To, to prevail. Talmud gets a little uncomfortable with it later, but at least in the Mishnah. 
According to the Talmuds, the motivation for adopting this lenient presumption is another value, a competing value, right? The value of marital intimacy or priya uvia. We find this in the Bavli explaining why truth is trumped in those particular, or concern for the truth is trumped. So again, this is all typical of a nominalist approach in which objective facts are important, but they're not consistently privileged and they can be trumped by other considerations and values. So I argue that just as Philo's truth claims about the Torah of Moses were a self-conscious choice made in full awareness of the alternative view that denied those truth claims, the rabbinic divorce of divine law and truth was a self-conscious choice made in full awareness of the alternative view that asserted the identity of divine law and truth, a view like Philo's or in a quite different way like the sectarians. Um, and we again can have recourse to the literary motif of mockery as evidence for this. Um, many rabbinic texts depict the mockery or the incredulity, right? These people who can't believe the rabbis are doing what they're doing. The mockery of outsiders who object to the rabbis' non-realist legal strategies. So Sadducees and Minim, I've written an article about this, or heretics or others are depicted as objecting to Pharisaic rabbinic laws and teachings that seem illogical, that seem unempirical, that seem counterfactual, uh, and that lack this verisimilitude, right? They don't seem to correspond with reality. Um, there's, a, again, a famous, maybe famous enough for us not to spend a lot of time on, but the text I've brought here from Mishnah um, Yadayim, there's some debate about this, but the, the, the part that I like about this particular text in Mishnah Yadayim, here you have Sadducees who are the spokesman for the other point of view, and they're objecting to kind of the non-realist approach of the Pharisees. Um, so the Sadducees complain, we complain against you, you Pharisees, because you say the holy writings defile the hands, but not the books of Homer. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai retorted, is that, is that the worst that you can say against the Pharisees? Right? It's, it's a great, he, he wears a mask here, which is great. Have we nothing against the Pharisees but this? Behold, they say that the bones of an ass are ritually pure, but the bones of Yochanan the high priest are impure. They said to him, wait, wait a minute, their impurity is proportional to their love for them, so that nobody would make spoons out of the bones of his father and mother. And he said, I got you, because it's the same with the holy writings. Their impurity is proportional to the love for them. The books of Homer, which aren't precious, they don't defile the hands. This is, this is great. The Sadducees are objecting to the Pharisaic ascription of impurity to scriptures. They view it as an insult that scripture would be deemed impure um, when pagan literature is not. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, who of course is sympathetic with the Pharisees, he, go, he pretends to go along with the Sadducean objection to teach them a lesson. Um, he carries their objection a step further. Not only do they insult scripture by saying that it defiles the hands, but you can go further. They insult God's high priest, Yohanan, by saying his bones defile when a donkey's bones do not defile. Now, he knows that they're going to take the bait. Uh, he knows that they accept the principle of the ritual impurity of human corpses and bones, but he's hoping to elicit from them a defense of that view, and it succeeds. That, they say, isn't real. Right? The impurity of bones is not real. It's not that it's somehow really impure. It's a pragmatic ruling we make to ensure that these bones are treated with respect. And then he takes off his mask and he says, aha, same thing here. This isn't real. We aren't saying that scripture is really impure in some way, but it's a pragmatic measure to ensure that it's not handled very much. So it's a staged dialogue with the Pharisaic hero of the story teaching the Sadducees a lesson in nominalism. Uh, don't pretend, he says, that you're such hard and fast realists. You yourselves engage in a nominalist understanding of attributing a status to something for pragmatic uh, purposes. Rabbinic sources depict Pharisees being criticized or ridiculed by Minim and Sadducees also for legal dodges and ruses. Um, a legal dodge that creates an appearance but not a reality of propriety. Um, uh, in preparing the ashes of the red heifer, for example, that leads Rabbi Yossi to um, say to his fellow sages, don't give the minim occasion to find fault, right? Le radot, to um, criticize us, just, just do the act, don't, don't do this legal dodge. And then people say, oh, you know, you're, you're legalists and you're not really uh, doing things the right way. Don't rely on a dodge, as Mishnah para. Um, and you find a similar admonition in the Tosefta <coughs> attributed to Rabbi Akiva. He says this whole ruse about uh, this 
legal fiction for, for drawing the water to mix the ashes. He says, You're, people are going to criticize us for this. This shows an awareness, right, that some, God's law somehow should not be about legal fictions and legal ruses. A final example is uh, one of a legal fiction. Um, the Eruv is, of course, a legal strategy by which genuinely, really, distinct domains can be declared by the rabbis to be a single domain to dodge certain Sabbath restrictions. And Mishnah Eruvin 6.2 and related texts in Yerushami and Bavli talk of a Sadducee who refused to participate in the Eruv, uh, and that made it impossible for everybody else living in the alleyway to, to be able to do it. But here again, the Sadducees are depicted as having little patience, very little patience for any Pharisaic rabbinic determination of of legal status that seems to be non-realist, which seems to contradict um, plain facts. Harnessing the gaze of the other as a kind of mirror, I think the rabbis are showing that they too are aware of the existence of a different perspective and that they are choosing their construction of divine law as non-realist, as nominalist, in conscious opposition to this alternative perspective. And I think that that thesis is confirmed um, by a non-rabbinic source that's contemporary, really contemporaneous with the earliest Tanitic period, the Gospel of Mark. In Mark 7, verses 1 to 23. Did I bring that text for you? I don't even know I did. I did. Oh, look at that. Okay. How many sources did I on truth? Where, what page is it on? Page 3. Page 3. Number 10. Oh, okay, yes. Oh, I took one little part of it, yes. Okay, so 10 to 13. So the longer in the longer story... The Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus why he and his disciples don't follow tradition, why they don't wash their hands before eating. Now, in his response, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees and explicitly for abandoning divine law. This is a great text for me, right? Because he actually articulates this division between divine law and traditions of the elders, which is just human law. And I think even Mosaic law, I think he saw really as just Moses' law um, in Mark 10. Um, so he rebukes them for abandoning divine law in order to follow human law. How well you nullify the commandment of God, of honoring parents, in order that you may preserve your tradition. Uh, the example he gives there is of using a legal fiction, basically, so that you don't have to support your parents. Uh, and then he goes on to provide another example, an illustration of this charge that they are more concerned about following human laws. Um, uh, so, I, so the text I gave you is the first one, honor your father and mother, but instead they don't <coughs> follow that divine law. Um, but instead, they have these legal fictions so that they don't even have to support them. Making void the word of God by means of your tradition. I think that's a conscious opposition, the divine word and the human word. And you do many similar things, right? So he's pointing to this legal ruse that enables people to avoid supporting their parents without technically violating the fifth commandment. So Mark 7 represents Jesus as familiar with at least the Mark in Jesus, which probably means Mark, I don't know. Um, is completely familiar with and accepting of the Greco-Roman dichotomy between divine law and human law, just like the author of the letter of Aristeus, Philo, and so on. The juxtaposition of the two is important evidence that in first century Palestine, this conceptual distinction was common currency among Jewish groups. Um, uh, Adela Yarbrough Collins notes in her commentary on Mark, that the Pharisees believed that their legal traditions were elaborations of the revealed divine law underwritten by divine authority. But Jesus is part of a discourse that regards these traditions as mere human law, and I would have to say it's because he thinks that they don't have the characteristic traits of what Mark probably accepts as identifying divine law, and therefore they're illegitimate. What's important for my purposes is that what marks these as human law is their, their fictive character, they're not real, they're not true, it's a legal trick that creates an appearance of, of piety, filial piety, when there's none. Um, and so the Mark and Jesus fits rabbinic representations of those who are mocking them, right? We are mocked by those who see what we do as simply a ruse or a dodge or a fictive practice. So in that sense, the rabbinic texts and the Mark and Jesus texts, they're mirror <coughs> images. Um, or I think a better term that Shia Cohen has used lately is they are antipodal. Um, there's a mocker and there's a mocked in each text, but one is a he but the mocker is a hero in one text, but he's the anti-hero in the other. So they both agree on what the mocker says and they both agree on the one who's mocked, but they value the positions differently. That's why they're antipodal. It's better than mirror, actually. Um, now I'm not suggesting 
Uh, and I think that's true of Philo. Philo mocks and is mocked by those who reject his truth claims and his rationality claims about the divine law. And as a mirror image, I think the rabbis depict themselves as mocked by those who think divine law must be absolutely true and rational. I'm not suggesting that, the Phi that Philo and the rabbis, who are separated in both time and space, were speaking to one another, but I am suggesting that each imagined himself to be speaking to just such an other, right? That that's who they imagined. Um, where are we in terms of time? I have some things I could say about rationality, but I, I just really don't know what your time constraints are. And I have, always have more to say. Tell me what is the actual end time of this uh, event. Oh, the event? Yes, the event. A quarter to two. Whole events quarter to two. So you would like me to maybe do no more than 10 minutes or so? Okay. Give me one second to think about how best to do that. <laughs> um, that's kind of a fun text to do. I, I, um, there, so, so let me just say something about rationality. I'll look at one text here and then get jump to a conclusion. So one text with a supporting text, <laughs> and I'll jump to a conclusion. I also want to. I, I also argue there's a whole there's there's actually a chapter in the book one on on the Torah and truth, one on the Torah and rationality, and one on the Torah and immutability. Um, so i will just giving you a little bit of the, the chapter on truth, a little bit on the chapter that deals with the Torah and rationality. For the rabbis, again, the idea that the Torah is divine doesn't necessarily mean it's intrinsically rational or universally accessible by reason. There is, there's, and I think there are lots of texts that I can show that prove that. So I'm going to spend my time rather talking about the text, which is the text most people say, but here's a text that proves they believe in a universal, rational, natural law. So I'm going right to the counter text that most people would hold up as being you know, proof of the opposite because I don't think it says that at all. So that's the Sifra text, um, Sifra Akhari Mot. If someone wants to tell me what page it's on, that would be great. <laughs> also three. That's also on three. Oh, that's okay. the next one. All right, so I am going in order then at least. The famous passage, again, it occurs also in Bavli Yoma. This is the famous passage, you shall observe my, uh, my judgments, Mishpatim and my Chukim, right, um, in Vayikra Yud Chet. You shall observe my judgments. These are matters written in the Torah, which had they not been written, it would be logical, using the word deen here, to write, such as robbery, sexual violations, idolatry, blasphemy, and bloodshed. Five, in fact, of the seven mitzvot no, uh, b'nei Noah. If they had not been written, it would be logical to write them. And, and then you shall observe also my chukim. Those are the ones which the evil impulse, Yetzir Hara, and the idolatrous nations of the world, and another text is Satan, they object to Meshivin Alehen, I'm pretty sure is the Hebrew there, such as the prohibition against eating pork. Look at, the, look at the things that are singled out here. Dietary laws, purity laws, ritual practices, right? Prohibition against eating port, uh, pork, the Shatnez, um, etc. Um, the purification from its Sorat, and so on. The evil impulse in the idolatrous nations of the world object to them. Scripture says, I am the Lord, meaning you are not permitted to, um, you know, Rashai, Rashiv, you're not permitted to object to my Hukotai. The text makes this distinction between Mishpatim and Chukim, the ones you would logically expect to find in Torah, and others that you wouldn't, and they seem arbitrary and irrational, and therefore people object to them. Um, what's the relative value of these two kinds of laws? This text has been held up by many people. David, David Novak, um, one among them, and certainly in the later, uh, the post-Talmudic Judaism is going to tell a whole different story here. I'm talking about the Talmudic period, so I'm very well aware that the story changes immediately once we get into the medieval period. But at least for my purposes, um, this is a text people hold up as saying, look, they believe there are these universal rational principles that would just, that exist independent of their inclusion in the Torah. I'm not sure that that's really what the text says. The passage as a whole, when you look at it in its entire context, so did I not bring you the entire, I think I did on the last page. I think I put, yeah, just as a, in case anybody wanted to read it for some light reading tonight, this is the entire context in which it's found. I don't cite it exactly. I've pulled out the piece that I've, I summarize it, I quote it, and then I'll summarize things as well. But what is this text doing? First of all, this text draws a very bright line between the laws and practices of Israel and the laws and practices of other nations. God's sovereignty over Israel is manifest in his decrees that he imposes upon them alone and they have to follow in part A, to the exclusion of all foreign laws, in part C, to the exclusion of all customs, in part F, in exclusion of any foreign wisdom. Uh, but there's a sense underlying this that 
Israel's laws somehow are not as nice and not as appealing and not as easy as the laws of other nations. And we see section B makes the remarkable claim that when God revealed the sexual laws, Leviticus 18 and 20, because this is dealing, of course, with Leviticus 18, right? When God revealed the sexual prohibitions, it was huge distress. Everyone's weeping and crying uh, at their, their tent. And he knew that the Israelites would object using that same word, meshiv, right? That was just said that the idolatrous nations and the Yetzer Haradu, it's the same. He knew that they would object to these, and therefore he had to make them unequivocal decrees enforced uh, by coercive power. Um, section D also gives voice to the perceived attractiveness of foreign ways. They're easier. Is there any harm in our observing these commandments if technically they're not law for us? They're just nicer. They're more appealing. They're easier. The circuses and the fancy clothes and the hairstyles, it's just easier and more appealing. Uh, so this is a theme that runs throughout, and the insistence always on Israel's exclusive loyalty to God's laws, because that's Israel's exclusive and particular wisdom, not that of the nations. Sandwiched in between this insistence on exclusive loyalty to God's decrees, instead of the easy or natural or logical laws of the nations, is our passage, section E, which makes that distinction. Look, of course, there are laws in the Torah that are easy. You'd find them in any legal system. Don't kill, don't rob, don't blaspheme. What's important are the laws that are hard. That's Israel's wisdom. That's what is of relevance and importance. It's not praising the Torah to say that it has these other laws that any legal system would have that you find easy to do. The laws of the nations are easy to do as well. That's not the praise and that's not the important thing that's valued in this ton of Itic text. And I, I think this reading, I can't make it as fully as I would like, but um, I think this reading is supported by the fact that we have other ton of Itic era texts that make the same claim. So take a quick look then, I guess it's on page three or four. Um, uh, for, first of all, we just have tons and tons of texts which characterize the law as a coercively imposed divine decree. So um, there's one, uh, number 12, which is from Sufre. Um, the Midbar. Um, this, of course, is a very important one. When they, God, rede God redeemed the Israelites not to be free men, but to be slaves to him. He redeemed them not to be sons, but to be slaves. And when they go out in the desert, he begins to issue decrees, some light and some heavy. Look at this. This is important. I think these words, uh, you know, Kalan and Chum, I think the words for light and heavy are not as people necessarily think they are. Um, I think they mean Rational and irrational, precisely. It's got nothing to do with the severity of them. We know that, and the rabbis say that explicitly. It's ones that are heavier, the mitzvot chamurot, aren't necessarily more heavily punished, and they're not necessarily more burdensome to do or perform. But I think that the common denominator is that they're illogical, and I think that there are some New Testament sources I just found last week that bear that out um, in, in Acts 15. You know, let's make, it, let's make it easy on people and just have them um, not perform idolatry, observe sexual laws, not partake of blood, let's make it easy and not make it hard by doing irrational things because people don't like to do irrational things they see as irrational. So I think we have the same linguistic usage here. That's, that's work I need to do yet to really make a strong case for. But he started to give them some light commandments and some heavier commandments. What are the heavier commandments? Sabbath. The sexual prohibitions. I suppose that's pretty heavy. Fringes and tefillin. The illogical stuff, right? And Israel began to object. And he says, you're my slaves. You just have to do it. It's a decree. It's arbitrary, but you have to do it. But why do I think that this is valued? If you take a look at the very famous passage by Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, how do I know that a person should not say, I don't want to wear mixed fibers. It's easy for me to observe the prohibition of Shadmas, right? I don't want to wear mixed fibers. I don't want to eat pork. I don't want to commit an incestuous sexual act. It's easy for me. This is no problem. To, observing the Torah is easy. No, no. Rather, you should say, I want to do all these things. What can I do? My Father in Heaven has imposed his decree on me. There's virtue in suppressing one's natural desire in order to follow divine law. That would make no sense in a Greco-Roman context, right? Greco-Roman discourses of natural law, that which is embedded in human nature, would not be able to make sense of this. He imagines an opposition, or more precisely, a manufactured opposition between human nature and divine law. It's a virtue to desire the very things the divine law prohibits, because in that way you define yourself as belonging to God, you, you demonstrate virtue, there's a 
passage in which Rav makes it very, very clear. What does God care whether you cut the neck of the animal this way or that way? No, it's to refine you. It's a discipline. It's simply a discipline to show your loyalty to God. It's to refine you. Um, so you shouldn't state that your desire runs with the law naturally, that it's easy for you. You should run against it so that the choice of law is conscious and uh, meaningful. Um, uh, again, I will not bring the text uh, in which Rav says what he says. So while, um, and it's interesting that in all these texts where the rabbis are demonstrating this point, what are the laws that they're using? Again, dietary laws, purity laws, and every now and then a ritual law, like tefillin. The same laws that were at the heart of the uneasiness of authors like the letter of Aristeas and Philo. So while the letter of Aristeas and Philo argue that the most arbitrary scriptural laws, the dietary laws and the ritual and purity laws are, are intrinsically rational. They accept the Greco-Roman idea that divine law must be rational and therefore I will prove that the Torah is divine law by proving it's rational. The rabbis move in the opposite direction. The point of these laws is their irrationality, which marks them as arbitrary decrees of the divine king and turns them into opportunities to express obedience and loyalty to God. Very long passage from um, Sikta to Rav Kahana is an extended reflection on the irrationality of the law the first of chapter 10 uh, of, of, the, of the fourth Pisca the, the, has 10 units, and the first unit opens with this refrain, who can bring forth a clean thing out of an unclean thing? Is it not the one, right? Is it not the divine being? Who can perform these various irrational things? You have the text there. It's a mark of the divinity, right, uh, uh, of these things, that they are irrational. Only the divine one could do such an irrational uh, and unbelievable thing. So. Um, to kind of draw some of this together now, um, I'll just give you the concluding section. Um, and again, that, that Pesikta to Rav Kahana text ends with the very famous text I'm sure you're all familiar with, the conversation between Rabbi Yochanan and this non-Jewish interlocutor. Again, the gaze of the other who comes and says, what are you doing? What is this purity ritual? And he gives them some answer, but then he turns to the students who say, you know, he's got a question. <laughs> That's not a bad question. What's your answer? He says, you know, it's not real. This is a nominalist thing we do, but what's the command of heaven? And so we do it for that reason. So um, Jenny Labens um, has, in her recent book, noted cases like that one and similar cases in which the rabbis employ um, an outsider but also will give different answers to different audiences. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai gives one answer to the non-Jew, and he gives another answer to his disciples who have asked the same question. And she argues that this sensitivity to different audiences finds parallels in the Gospel of Mark, in the, in the text that I was talking about before, Mark 7. The Pharisees and the scribes ask Jesus and his disciples why they are not washing their hands. And Jesus gives actually three different responses. He gives one to the Pharisees and the scribes, then he gives another, a different one to the crowd. And then he gives another one to his um, students in private about impurity and how impurity is not real. Uh, it's, all, it's, it's moral behavior, which is what is impure and not the things we eat and so on. Um, and in Mark 10, Pharisees also ask Jesus whether divorce is lawful. And again, he gives two answers, one to the Pharisees, which is pretty abusive and unpleasant, and then one to his students. So for our purposes, the similarity between that and what I think Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai is doing is more important than just a formal similarity. It's a substantive similarity. Uh, Jesus' ans first answer in Mark 7, again, rebukes the Pharisees for abandoning divine law to follow human law. When he answers the crowd and when he answers the disciples, he's critiquing their understanding of purity, and he denies the power of food to cause defilement. It's just not a real thing. He insists that what, what's important is, um, uh, uh, and what is by definition divine, is morality, not bodily fluxes, not hand washing. And that resonates with Greco-Roman discourses of divine law as dealing with rational, ethical truth. And in Mark 10, he answers the Pharisees' question about divorce with an argument from nature um, about you know, the, the, the union created uh, as, uh, by marriage reflecting the natural um, creation of male and female. Um, Moses' law de permitting divorce was an unhappy concession to the hardness of the human heart. And I think he's really strongly going in the direction of saying it's a human enactment. I think there's a reason he refers to the law of Moses. This is not to him a divine law. Um, and he says it can't uproot an eternal divine law grounded in human nature at the time of creation. And that echoes the realist approach of, uh, the, of law that's prevalent at Qumran as well. There's all sorts of weird intersections here. 
I think those Markan dialogues, as I said, are very important evidence that we have these dueling conceptions of divine law alive and well and sparking controversy in the first century CE in the land of Israel, no less than in the first century in Alexandria. I think there's no doubt that first and second century um, Jews living in the land of Israel, Pharisees, sectarians, Jesus followers, Tanaim, I think they were all familiar with Greco-Roman discourses of divine law and that it is different from human law and they are led to a cognitive dissonance that forces them to look at their own heritage of divine law and to evaluate it in that light and they come up with very different responses. The rabbinic texts and the non-rabbinic texts for all their variety um, are mirror images of each other. So the letter of Aristeas, 4th Maccabees, Philo, the sectarian literature, and Mark and Jesus for all their differences, and there are differences among them, the one thing they have in common is they accept the terms of the debate. They accept the Greco-Roman dichotomy that there's divine law and there's human law, and they make fun of those who don't accept that. Um, then they differ. They, they, they are the same in that they accept that dichotomy, but then they split. The Hellenistic Jewish sources say not only does divine law have to be rational and true, but the Torah is divine law, therefore it's rational and true. The Markan sources, the New Testament sources say divine law has to be true, Law of Moses clearly isn't. It's irrational, arbitrary. Get rid of it. <laughs> and the rabbis now are answer number three, right? The rabbis resist the dichotomy altogether of divine law and human law and all of the things that go along with that. And they actively construct a portrait of divine law whose very divinity is enhanced rather than harmed by its divorce from truth and its arbitrary character. To those who accept the Greco-Roman conception of divine law, the idea that divine law is not self-identical with truth, is not rational, would be scandalous. It would be completely scandalous. And I would argue that the rabbis knew that. The rabbinic conception of divine law was a self-aware choice. Evidence of this self-awareness, I think, may be found in rabbinic texts that feature that motif of mockery. In dozens upon dozens of texts, the rabbis explicitly represent their conception of divine law as inspiring ridicule and mockery on the part of non-rabbinic others. In 4th Maccabees, Philo, the Gospel stories, the mocker, right, the mocking critique prevails over those who don't conceive of divine law in natural law terms. But in the mirror image rabbinic stories, the mocker is dismissed or defeated by those who conceive of divine law in very different terms. Uh, that's all on one foot. It's so much more complicated than all of that, but I hope that gives you some idea of the ideas I've been playing with a lot um, lately. Um, and it's, it really needs so much more nuance than I've given it here because, of course, there's not one thing called rabbinic literature, right? So there's lots of differentiation that has to be made um, early and late and Palestinian and Babylonian. And actually, as we trend later and more Babylonian, the more they become uncomfortable with um, their construction, the earlier construction of, of divine law as why can't divine law be particular? Why can't it be, um, you know, value things other than truth sometimes? Um, why can't it include arbitrary decrees? They start to be a little more uncomfortable with that. And you see sometimes the Babli will undo some of the things that in earlier sources seem to stand without any embarrassment um, at all. So it's, it's really a much more complicated story, but hopefully this will provoke at least some conversation. So thank you.